We all love kittens, right? Um, okay, so I think it's time to start, right? Okay, so let's go. Um, so uh, we've heard a lot about package and names today. Um, trying to present something which is a small initiative, and kind of a social experiment on the one end and uh, a standard experiment on the other end to define a common way to discuss about packages, irrespective of what they really are. And I agree with what Sam said, we don't know what really a package is, but intuitively we feel what it is. Uh, nevertheless, it's difficult sometimes to talk about them. So quick, quick thing about me, so I'm, I'm on a mission to make it easy to reuse free, libre and open source software. And I contribute to quite a few uh, projects including the Linux kernel, S-Trace. I write code in S-Trace, I don't write code in, uh, uh, in the kernel. I just bug every maintainer to ensure that they put proper licensing information in, in their code files. Um, I'm a co-founder of SPDX and I used to be a committer on Eclipse and JBoss. Uh, most of the code I write is either um, Python, JavaScript when I'm under duress, um, mostly Python and a bit of C, and I'm dabbling, trying to dabble in Rust these days. So why, why should you care? Very often we have more than one package environment, right? Not only one. So how many of you use only a single package manager? Which one is it? Yes. Okay, that's fair. Portage. Portage, okay, that's fair too. <laughs> but nevertheless, you're, you're rare birds, and? Pac-Man. Pac-Man, okay. So th there, are, there are a few oddballs, <laughs> or a few, a few advanced users, which have found the right way to actually simplify their life, and I commend you for that. But most of us are morons, and we continue to use many package managers, whether it's a good thing or not. So we should use Nix, Pac-Man, and Portage or for Gen 2. Uh, and sometimes it's probably even a problem for some of these package managers when you need to talk about a package across these different package managers, it's surprisingly difficult. Why do you want to do that? Well, there's some narrow use case. One is you build an inventory of every package out there, like Andrew does with libraries.io. Uh, and you want just every package. Or Graphias, which is a new uh, API from Google project to provide information about things that run in a container, an API. And you want to get information about not every package, but any package that exists in a container, for instance. Irrespective of whether it's a system or an application package. So the problem, if I'm telling you I'm using file, which one is it, you know? To each of us, it means very simply something different. If I'm Python developer, okay, it's the file library, but no, it's, it's also a JavaScript library. It's eventually, most of this case would be the actual fine free file package, which is the original libmagic file command. But here we're talking about the same thing, more or less, but not exactly. Each free package is different ways. And that's a very simple problem uh, I'm trying to address with that. So more formally is that we reuse software from many different places. In some case, if you're forced to use JavaScript massively with a lot of NPMs, if you're forced to use containers too, you will use a lot of packages across many containers eventually. Um, and each of these package manager environments, tools, have different ways to talk about mostly the same thing. Now, each of them have different protocols eventually. They rely on different package repository, registry. Uh, some will use Git, some will use uh, talk over HTTP. Uh, the point is that when I say NPM, it encompasses a lot of things. You know, it's a tool, it's a convention to document the package, it's eventually primarily a language a way to build the package, a way to express dependencies, a lot of things that goes into these three layers, whether it's npm, pip, gem, uh, 
it's, it's a whole protocol of its own that describes an entire system. And the whole idea here is to say, well, rather than try to make that complicated, is try to make it very simple. If NPMs mean NPMs, then we'll use it. Now, tracing back a bit on our origins, why, why are you trying to do this URL standard of sorts? Um, so I maintain a tool called scan code. Who does two things. It scans your code for license file and mentions. It's kind of a search engine for license where the index is very small. It's about 20 meg megabytes. And the query is eventually gigabytes of code. So be the inverse of a Google where you have tiny queries, very large index. Here you have tiny index and eventually large query. Um, and it also scans and parses package manifest and try to stuff them and squeeze them in a common model. So in this model, I have the problem, which is how do I identify file as being a Ruby gem or a PyPy package or a node package? I cannot just say file. That's not enough as a name. Um, then there were some folks from JFrog and Google doing this Graphias project uh, uh, at the middle of the fall. And I stumbled on their homepage, they had something called, so they, they need to aggregate information about package deployed in containers. That's the primary purpose of the API. And they were having some kind of informal specification. This is, oh, this is how you identify package as resources with some informal URI of sorts, which was like maven column, a name of a maven group ID and an artifact ID and a version, and similar things for Debian, RPM, things. It says, that's interesting. Uh, that was not super formalized, but that looked really cool. Then I was also diving into the, the schemas and the internals of libraries.io um, because I love packages. And, and I saw there also something which was very similar. I mean, the, the notion of uh, the type of package, where it's coming from, the versions. And Looking at a few other ones, most other package indexes at some level seem to use the same approach, each with subtle differences, but mostly the same approach. And so the solution was to say, well, let's try to come with a simple and expressive URL, which is formally defined, and that can abstract all the subtle differences and can be reused across all of these. Again, for a very narrow use case. I mean, if you don't do a libraries.io or a scan code, maybe you're not interested. Though, if you're using many packages and somebody in your team asks you, uh, can you tell me all the third party open source package that are used in our product? What's going to be your answer? How can you provide an inventory of this set of packages in a simple and clear and clean way. Well, the applications may be multiple. You may just need to know. Uh, you want to ensure that the license match your license policy. If you're a GPL project, you don't want proprietary software. And maybe the other way around applies too. You want to make sure your packages uh, maybe don't have security bugs, uh, quality problem, and so on. So even though you may not have the concerns of uh, detecting packages or inventoring packages on a large scale, you still have in the small, uh, and everyone that develops software may have this problem. Now, whenever you start a standards, you know, you see, uh, okay, they're using this standard, this standard, this standard. Let's come with a new one to roll them all. And, and that's an easy trap to fall into. And, and hopefully, uh, we've tried to avoid that at some level. It's not entirely possible yet. So the approach. First thing, it's, it's been so far mostly a social experiment in the sense that, uh, so I had this issue on scan code and then I started chatting with uh, with Andrew and others and, and ping them, started a GitHub repo, started to ping folks there, put some documents and elicit more feedback. Uh, really trying to get something which was as inclusive as possible from the very inception of, of the discussion. And the other important thing in the approach was to say, well, let's not try to invent anything new. 
You know, if an NPM version says, uh, I don't know, Angular at one to three, it shouldn't be much more difficult to express a URL for an NPM. <coughs> so it's an attempt to standardize, but rather than trying to come with yet another way, it's more defining a few data elements and an optional syntax to express it as a URL. Hopefully uh, avoiding the, the standards trap. So now, any questions so far? Things make about sense? You're not to, the folks that are coming from overseas are not too jet lagged and starting to, to doze. I see someone sleeping. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for waking you up. That's not, that's not nice. <laughs> okay, so what is a Perl? It's six data elements, a type like NPM, RubyGem, and so on, a name and a namespace, so two elements, one of them optional, the namespace, a version, and that's pretty much it. The rest is more extra things which you want to use only uh, in special case when they're needed. So some example of a syntax, uh, a Bitbucket repo. So here my type is Bitbucket. It encapsulates a lot of things about Bitbucket, which maybe it could be using Git or Mercurial. <clears throat> There's an API when I know it's Bitbucket that I can query, which returns certain information. <clears throat> and I know exactly where to go and which repository it points to, which revision it points to, in this case, this, this revision. And the same applies to GitHub or else. Uh, now, the thing is that it's this Bitbucket encompasses again a lot of information. And that's why we are treating that as eventually a quasi-package-like animal, <coughs> where there's, there's a lot of things and there's more than just a Git or a Mercurial package uh, protocol and, and repo behind it. Another example for a Debian package, uh, where here part of the namespace is what's the distro that's actually, uh, uh, what's the, the, the provider of the distribution, because there's more than one Debian, there's a lot of derivatives. And in the case of a system package, sometimes you need information about architectures. You have native code that's been built, so, and there may be other qualifiers that come after the query string. And the right part, right? Yeah, right. The right part is the query string, basically. So some more example of syntaxes, uh, Docker images, which may be from a registry that you know about, or are just published on the standard Docker registry, typically identified by a hash, a checksum on the image. Uh, a gem, sometimes has a platform or not, mostly for Ruby, it could be Java. Um, Go are inter is an interesting animal because there's, there's really no notion of uh, naming beyond the language packages themselves. And they represent namespace. And here we're just saying, well, last segment of the name is actually defining a whole uh, package. And inside you can have subpass, hence the, the pound side which is to define an optional segment, which is a path inside something which is packaged, which you may or may want to track. It's entirely optional. You may want to track just a subset of a sub-package use or a whole repo. The point is that it offers this flexibility when it's needed and when it's possible. Another example from Maven, where you have a, a combo of what they call artifact ID and group ID, and additional you could point, in this case, uh, in another repository, and uh, that's possible for others, and so on and so on. So if you think about a very basic case for NPM, you've just prefixed the way you reference an NPM as an NPM user with NPM. That's pretty much it, not much more than that. So it, it's meant to be extremely simple. Um, you would wonder why I call PyPy things for Python and not pip, for instance. Pip being the tool used to install Python package. Well, pip in itself doesn't encompass the whole protocol for Python packages. That's the protocol of the PyPy type registry, 
which expose an API, a way to download, and also all the conventions to document versions and dependencies that really qualify the package, the package itself. And not so much only the tool, there can be several other tools that can be used to install uh, uh, Ruby packages. The same way if you think about Gem, you could install them with Bundle. And most of the time you will be using Bundler to, to install Gems. Okay, so six data elements, if we dive, dive a bit more, uh, most of them are optional. And in fact, there's only one that's required beside the type, so a type and a name. So it's eventually saying npm call on something. In this case, you're not specifying any version. There are cases where it's actually a valid use case and you don't care about the version per se. Then the namespace is also something which is optional. Some may use it, scoped npms, artifact id group id for maven require that and it makes sense to put that in namespace. Um, the other thing you don't see in this URL, there's actually no host, right? doesn't tell me where to get the package. And so the point here is you get the package from wherever you use, usually get it from. Uh, when you npm install by default, unless you have a special configuration, you get it from the npm registry. And that applies to whether you use a pnpm, yarn, or npm, or any other command line tools to provision your package. Same thing for Maven. If you uh, install uh, something with Maven, it will go by default to Maven Central. So there is, in the vast majority of the case, a default centralized public registry for the packages. So it doesn't make sense to repeat it over and over as a mandatory attribute. It doesn't make sense to make it in the path at all times. But you put that as a qualifier if and only if you need it when you use something which is not uh, on the public registry or another alternative, uh, uh, alternative package uh, repository, like a private registry, for instance, if needed. And so qualifiers, query string, key value pairs can be anything. It makes it easy. You can stuff any kind of a weird, off Broadway, quirky thing, uh, which may in some case be useful and needed, but then you don't pollute the standard command case 90% of the time with everything that's needed in 10% of the cases. And we, we discussed also already about subpath. Okay, so let's put that to rest. There's no host, there's no authority, as it's called in the URI or URL scheme. Yet, this is a URL, this is a locator. When I say just npm column angular at something, it points exactly to one central host, which is the NPM registry, and therefore I can locate my package without any ambiguity whatsoever. And there's been a long debate on that topic, but this is not about purists. Uh, this is a URL, it's also a URI, like every URL, and it's been reviewed by real authorities for URIs and URLs, namely uh, folks like uh, Anne Van uh, Kirsten and Mark Nottingham. Uh, Mark Nottingham being the guy be behind the HTTP protocol and Anne being uh, um, uh, the lead of the URL spec for the wet working group. So they know a bazillion on more stuff than each of us combined about URLs. So I, I trust their judgment and we ping them to actually get their feedback and their take on the topic. <coughs> and so there's one tidbit today that needs a bit ironing. It's not entirely settled. There's really potentially two ways to present a pearl. The one at the bottom is the one I've showed you today. One possibility would be to have, oh, and there's a typo, it would be PKG, something like PKG or pearl, a single scheme and prefix for all the pearls which could make it eventually something simpler if you want to have that registered as an official RFC in the, in the future, because we would register only one scheme as opposed to one scheme per package type. And I, I'm really eliciting feedback there. I don't know what, uh, so we would prefer to have one single scheme, PKG, and then a type, versus having 
the second case where you have many different schemes, one per package type. So case one, one prefix. Okay, and case two, uh, one unique uh, prefix for each package type. It's, it's about even, maybe a tiny bit more for the, the PKG as long as it doesn't have a typo, but... <laughs> Excuse me? So why? Why, why, why you prefer the former, the first or the second? Well, what you said, simplicity of implementation further down the line, right? So it's, it's not simplicity of implementation, it's simplicity of official registration as a URI scheme uh, uh, as an official RFC. So it's not, the implementation doesn't make much difference between these two cases. Yes? The only advantage I see is if you want to extend the protocol to support something else than package management. But other than that, the second one is the best. Because if you want to support something that is not really closely related to package managers, then if you don't have the PKG prefix, you, you know, I don't see how you can do that. Okay. Other than that, the second one is the best. Yeah, the second one is simpler and it's because there's less, it's three less, I mean, four less letters total, so that's, that's appealing <laughs> on, a, on a large volume. The first way is uh, unique. If you imagine a future where a web browser wants to make yeah. this clickable, they have to implement a whole list of which prefixes are packages, which may be extending and not fully known. And if you have this uh, PPG at start, it knows this is one we have to make, I have to open with my future imaginary um, universal package manager program. Yeah, so that's, by the way, that's an interesting possible option, which is to, to write kind of unifying meta package manager which would install things from any places. Uh, yes? Uh, implementer of this thing in library bio. Yes? The top one means I can dynamically pull packages from places, from manifest files, and not need to know about new uh, package managers as they're invented. <coughs> it just happens. It means that the project can go into a maintenance mode. It doesn't need updating like a time zone every, like, I'm going changes need updating all the time, right? I, I every, do that. Every okay. Every new scheme needs approval. Excuse me? Every new scheme needs a new approval. So like, I think going with the first one gives you more flexibility within your already approved URL scheme. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, yeah. I, the reason why I brought the problem is that I was much more in favor of the second one at first, but it's eventually more of a source of problems down the road. And, and maybe these few extra letters are worth it, as long as they're spare right. <laughs> okay, um, now in terms of language implementations, we have today a Go and a Python implementation. And the implementation is very simple. I mean, there's a spec uh, that you can see here, um, which is evolving, and we're accepting any pull requests on this spec, literally. Um, it's been a bit quiet since the, the a bit quiet since the the, the holiday break, but uh, there was really this issue that I wanted to discuss at first time, and I was waiting for having a bit of that chat, whether we should prefix it with a unique prefix, and I think that's settled now, uh, mostly. Um, and there's some folks which have discussed. I think there's already a Java implementation somewhere. Um, <laughs> and I said Python, Python and Go. It's pretty trivial to implement, especially if there's already a URL parser, in most cases, available uh, on all the, the, the platforms. And so we need some help if you want to contribute something. Um, I hope that my project will be accepted again as a Summer of Code project this year. And I'll put a few tasks uh, for doing that, it can be a fun, can fizz bus like programming project where you have uh, four or five different language implementation to do as a student. Same thing. Um, to help the implementation, we have a single unit test suite, which is just a set of uh, expectations in JSON. 
So we can have things which are mostly compliant. And some credit and contributors, again, I said it's a social experiment. And we had a lot of uh, 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 contributions there. And that's it. Thank you very much. We don't have any time for questions, but Philippe will be back for the panel. Um, and now we need to